Hi, I'm Jeff Wells, uh, actually the guy who wrote the Prezzo. And uh, thanks for having me up here. Uh, as you probably could tell in your program, hopefully this wasn't your second choice and the other room's totally packed. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, flow analysis and the kind of revolution uh, in security monitoring it's uh, provided to a lot of companies over the past few years. Uh, and uh, I'm going to motivate the discussion by first talking about, uh, you know, general security issues and the kind of things you're likely to hear at the beginning of most presentations. We're going to zero in on just exactly what's missing uh, from a conceptual standpoint in most architectures and then talk about how this fits the bill. And then I'm going to zero in uh, more narrowly and narrowly on tools and in particular a tool that uh, I've been selling for the past four years. Uh, mainly because it's currently pretty unique. Uh, I expect to see a lot more competition pop out because of our success and the fact that our company was just bought by Cisco. Uh, but uh, right now it somewhat stands alone. I think you'll be surprised at what you can get from a very simple and venerable protocol. <clears throat> so where are we today? Uh, so, you know, we've all, if we're involved in security at all, and in fact even in networking, familiar with the fact that over the past you know, four or five years at least, if not a little longer, mostly every company in the Fortune 500 uh, has suffered some sort of devastating data breach. Some of them have been widely reported. Uh, some of them because they followed on the tail of another you may not have heard of. But you know, for example, the RSA hack, which was very famous, that actual attack was perpetrated against 700 large companies, including pretty much everyone you've ever heard of and pretty much successful in every uh, instance. Uh, and then last year we had the really egregious attack against Sony, uh, Sony Pictures, uh, where essentially everything of value in the entire company's infrastructure was taken. Not merely their intellectual property, which were four unreleased movies, but their entire email store, all of their HR data, uh, all of their internal uh, data. Uh, basically, the attackers got everything. And uh, they had bragged early on uh, when the attack was first discovered that they had stolen 100 terabytes of data. And the entire security community thought this was ludicrous and figured that it, if it was even close, the only possible way is that some insider had walked out with an actual physical piece of hardware with this data on it. But in fact, in retrospect, they discovered that data had been lifted from their network by moving that data through their internet link uh, over a period of time. And the first Sony heard of it is when the attackers started harassing them online. So uh, it was super egregious. Uh, and probably to this day, at least uh, as far as reported attacks go, the most devastating attack that's uh, been perpetrated just because of the breadth of what was stolen. Now, what a lot of companies who aren't Fortune 500 companies have, uh, I think, uh, been telling themselves over the past uh, few years is that you know, yes, these APT-style attacks are, are devastating. Yes, they are hard to stop. Uh, but, you know, apparently they're only going after these big companies, so I'm probably under their radar. But what always happens in security with attackers is they'll build their own tools to do these things, and then they will release the tools. The tools will become democratized and widely available, and then anyone can use them. And so there are places on the Internet you can go today to not only buy these tools with a credit card, you can also rent them. You can also rent experts to run them for you and attack anyone you want. So after the, the Sony breach's breadth had become obvious in January of last year, I pulled these uh, screenshots off hackmageddon.com. And uh, Hackmageddon basically uh, compiles a list of reported breaches. These are breaches that are worthy of reporting to some entity, whether it be a government entity uh, or you know, some a police department or whatever, you know, worthy, note, noteworthy breaches. And what I found, this is the first two weeks of January, is that almost none of these are large companies. These are small government entities, medium-sized businesses, et cetera. And the motivation for a lot of these hacks was not money, but activism. Uh, and most of them are devastating, and uh, most of them were accomplished with these APT-style tools. So. No one is below the radar of these attackers. Everyone is vulnerable and they are attacking everyone. And if you have a medium sized or larger business, they're almost certainly in your network today. 
you know, at Landcope, uh, I've been involved in installing uh, our tool set on a number of different uh, customer sites. Many different sized customers, most of them large Fortune 500s, and in every case we found uh, attackers resident in the network that they weren't aware of. In fact, in one of our largest customers, we found that 40% of their internal desktop machines, which was some 30,000 systems, infected with a variant of Configure that had been written just for them and that they had no idea was there. None of their traditional tools discovered it. So, you know, what's missing? I mean, frankly, if Sony can't protect its crown jewels, what are any of the rest of us supposed to do? I mean, they had everything. And these are all the things that are you know, recommended every year by Gartner. Uh, they're on all the magic quadrants. Uh, and for 15 plus years since the blasters and the slammers exposed AV and signature-based IDS is worthless, uh, you know, we've all been buying this stuff and spending tens of billions of dollars a year on it. Yet, year after year after year, these hackers are coming in and just ripping us off. So what is exactly is missing? They've got all these tools, they've got all the expertise, they're paying a lot of money to security specialists, and their, their uh, networks are Swiss cheese. <clears throat> What's holding us back? Well, the first one's the one that always surprises me the most. I've been involved in technology since the 70s, uh, professionally. Uh, and it's amazing uh, how fossilized people get in tech. You might expect it from like a manufacturer that makes like car parts, you know, for people to get kind of set in their ways, but tech is supposed to be this quick, quick moving, forward thinking industry. But when you work in tech, it's really pretty surprising how quickly everyone fossilizes and says, nope, I got my audit checklist and here's the tools I gotta have. And when you try and introduce something new, nobody's interested, it wasn't on so-and-so's analyst list and it ain't happening. So inertia is very dangerous. Uh, the bad guys don't have it. Uh, they are constantly looking for something new. So inertia should be purged from your security operations as soon as possible. Uh, analysts, of course, uh, a lot of analysts, uh, they, they call their clients, they ask them what they think, they recompile that data and then they sell it back to them. So what you're looking at is a list of trends. Uh, very rarely is it something truly forward thinking. So we can get trapped by looking at what analysts think. There are too many solutions. Uh, you know, if you go to RSA here coming up uh, or any other security conference with uh, a, a large booth area, there are literally thousands of people presenting. They all seem to be saying the same thing. They all swear they can solve the problem. And it's uh, just totally bewildering. Uh, and finally, the most important thing we're missing is a real understanding. So uh, like almost no other discipline, security is full of three-letter algorithms and dark, dark secrets. Uh, and uh, people that like to uh, hold things very close to their chests, and so uh, there's a lot missing from what we know about these problems. Well, what I'd like to do is uh, use some analogies to show you that, in fact, you understand these problems really well. You just haven't been looking at them from the right point of view. In fact, we're born and raised to understand almost all the problems that we face in asset protection. So the first one I want to talk about is banks, right? Banks have been around a long time. They have been raided and pillaged uh, by bandits forever. And so they have evolved over thousands of years, lots and lots of strategies to protect hard assets, right? For example, uh, multi-layer perimeter defenses, right? They have hard looking exteriors. In fact, they look hard so that people will not even want to try. Uh, thick walls, thick doors, et cetera. Uh, and then layer after layer inside, cages, uh, vaults with vast vault doors, another cage in here, more locks in here. Uh, so they have this you know, multi-layered defense that you often hear people talk about in IA as a good idea in your network as well. Secure transport. If a, a bank wants to move an asset from one site to another, they use an armored car. This is like a VPN. <clears throat> Ubiquitous pervasive monitoring. When you walk into a bank, there's almost no place you can go in that bank where you cannot be seen and aren't being watched by someone or at least recorded. Uh, and there's usually someone behind the scenes watching all of it, not merely recording it. Controlled entry and controlled internal movement. So when you come into a bank, you're observed. People look at you to see whether or not you look like you might be suspicious. Uh, 
there's usually very few portals. It doesn't have doors everywhere. It just has one or two very, very strong doors. It may have armed guards. When you're inside, there are plenty of places where you're not able to go unless you have the appropriate credentials and people know who you are. And finally, they have strong governance. Anybody ever worked in a bank? I see a couple, okay. So the bank have a security policy? How many people in the bank who worked there were required to know the security policy? Anybody? Everyone, right? And if they didn't, if they just said, no, nah, it's not important, they didn't sign that they read it, how long would they be working there? Right? And what if they didn't follow it in a bank? Right? Generally, you're fired. Okay? So map, map that to your IT experience. You're in IT security. You come up with your policy, you publish it, everybody's got to click the button, and then people ignore it, they delete all the stuff off their laptop, they download things, they surf Facebook, they post stuff they're not supposed to, and what happens to them? Nothing, right? So there's a huge difference between the way an experienced company that has hard assets to protect approaches security and the way we're forced to because of how seriously most people take it in an IT environment. And everything's driven by policy. So in a bank, first there's the policy, and then there are the tools and the processes to implement the policy. We don't go buy tools and then write a policy to fit them, right? Policy drives everything. So you can tie these things all together. Uh, all of them will map to some sort of IT uh, security thing because it's the same thing. You're securing an asset. Right, so perimeters are the same thing as firewalls, ACLs, and your own strong doors and locks and such. Secure transport is the same thing as an encrypted VPN. Ubiquitous pervasive monitoring in the past has meant IDS or distributed sniffing if you're insanely wealthy. Uh, log monitoring, SNMP, uh, controlled entry and internal movement, AAA and NAC, etc. So all these things can be mapped. So when you're thinking about the security problems you're facing and how they don't work, Try to think about something else that you may have some familiarity with and think about how it's done there. So, you know, what do banks do to protect assets that we in IT don't? So think about that for a minute. We'll dig into an analogy that's even more illustrative, which is how you protect your home, all right? The assets you actually really, really care about, the ones you don't just blow off, right? What do we do in our house to protect our critical assets? And more pointedly, if uh, you were sitting at home at dinner and somebody sat down who didn't belong at the dinner table and started eating your mashed potatoes, would you know it, <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> unless you were blind drunk, uh, almost certainly, right? You would know immediately. In fact, they likely wouldn't get into the room. If you're sitting down eating dinner and you heard a noise in the kitchen from the back door, you're gonna be up and out of your chair. And if it's someone you didn't recognize, all kinds of things that start happening. You know, some folks have moved towards the threat Others would move away and take, you know, the people that were weaker away uh, to guard them. Uh, all sorts of automatic things that you learned as a child, and some of them instinctive, would happen immediately in response to that threat. But what's important is that you'd recognize it. And you recognize it because you know what belongs in your environment. Not only do we have this policy against the unknown, but we have differentiated policy. So if we're sitting down at dinner, with uh, all the people we do know, and one of them begins acting very strangely. Let's say they leap up on the table and start kicking the mashed potatoes. We're not gonna sit there and blithely continue eating them. We will also react. Our reaction may not be as strong or as violent as it would against a stranger, but we would try to restrict their motion, figure out what's going on, maybe call the, you know, an ambulance, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Well, let's say you know, every week Uncle Bob comes over to watch football on Sunday or Monday nights. Uh, and it's totally cool if Uncle Bob just walks in the front door on Sunday or Monday nights to watch football because he does it every week. It's totally cool if he goes in his, your kitchen and gets a beer, right? That raises no red flags. You sit back in your easy chair. Uncle Bob's a great guy. We've known him our whole life. But if Uncle Bob vanished and you went upstairs an hour later and found him in your bedroom digging around in your closet, you'd react, right? Again, it's out of place. It's not normal. Uh, and you would have some sort of reaction to it. If you came home from the theater and your TV was missing, how long would it take you to notice? Seconds, right? So, you know, what is it about your house that's so different than the IT situation? I mean, we 
got most of the other things that we have in IT and in banks. We've got strong walls and doors and locks and secure transport, that nice mini minivan you bought from Volvo or whatever uh, for the kids. Uh, you know, we have policy. We're raised with it. Uh, don't talk to strangers. Keep the doors locked. Those are uh, security policies. Uh, and we teach these things to our kids. And there are consequences if they do not follow them. We pay attention to our surroundings. We know what belongs in every single portion of our house. We know what it looks like. We probably know what's in the back of the closet in every room in the entire house. If something's out of place, we're looking for it. We're always wandering around the house, looking around, and just as part of what we do, uh, notice when things are out of place. This is effective because we have complete visibility. There's no part of the house that's restricted from our visibility. There's no room that's locked, and we just can't go in and look in our own home, right? We have complete visibility everywhere. And we know when something's out of place. So not only do we see everything in the environment, we can tell what belongs, what's normal in the environment. And these two things are absolutely critical. And when something is out of place, we act, right? We have a set of actions that we uh, take on when things are out of place, as does the bank. <clears throat> we can't secure our houses without all the other security things that we've talked about already, the same types of things you have in IT security. We also could not possibly secure them if we did not have ubiquitous visibility into the environment and a knowledge of what's normal so that we could react when things go out of whack. So I contend that this is the missing link. Uh, there may be other things that we do or don't do or implement or don't implement perfectly, uh, but this just doesn't exist in most networks. Uh, and I think it's this exact thing that has been uh, the biggest problem when it comes to people trying to secure them. So what do we do to gain visibility, right? There's, you know, now we know we have this problem. Uh, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to get visibility into every part of the environment? Uh, most of our networks are enormous, or at least seem enormous when you're working on them all the time. Uh, they may have tens or hundreds or thousands of segments scattered across an enormous geography hosts on them that you've never seen before popping on and off all the time. What am I going to do to see what's going on on it? <clears throat> so what would be the ultimate? Right, so we just uh, go to uh, you know, some vendor and tell them we want their distributed <laughs> sniffer solution. And we buy a sniffer for every layer two segment in the entire network and set up span sessions everywhere and turn that all on and start recording every packet. Who thinks they can afford that? Right? Even the tiniest networks uh, that would be very difficult. I had a customer when I worked at Cisco years ago uh, that had a pretty good sized WAN and they tried to do this just in their main data center and they spent $10 million on it. Uh, you know, got them a lot of visibility. Uh, about eight hours of history uh, in the huge racks and racks of disks that they had. Uh, but in that eight hours, they had every packet. Uh, but unfortunately, they couldn't tell what was going on anywhere on their WAN with over 4,000 WAN sites. They couldn't tell what was going on in any of their IDFs. Uh, really, all they were looking at was the core of their data center. Uh, and the problem is, the APT style attacks, they attack these, and they attack handhelds, and they attack machines that are likely to be carried into a WAN site. And then once they get on them, they masquerade as that legitimate person. So by the time they are in your data center moving around, they don't look unusual. They look like a valid user. So really, not only are you, do you waste a lot of money by buying these solutions everywhere, and there are places where they're appropriate, uh, but really you're not looking at where all the risk is. Uh, so this is titanically expensive. Uh, it doesn't scale large environments anyway. There's no vendor of such a solution that can cover a large network if you went to them with all the money in the world and said you wanted a a sniffer on every link. They couldn't do it without selling you many, many, many instances of their product. And most of them have no way to tell what's normal. They're going to give you very, very powerful graphing and the ability to uh, dig into the packet on every packet in the environment, but you don't really have an easy way to tell whether any particular packet is out of whack. Uh, back in uh, the late 90s, uh, Cisco's uh, CAT uh, 5000 5500 series switches were touted for their ability to switch 30 million packets per second. Today, the fastest switches are orders of magnitude faster. So if you have just one switch that can switch 30 million packets per second and you're capturing all that data, which packet's the bad packet, right? 
So this has not really been all that useful except as a research tool. Uh, what we want is a tool that can help us stop the attacker before they steal our data. So we need to shrink the amount of time between when the problem begins and when we find them. So we talk about traditional monitoring the way we talk about wiretapping. Anybody ever see the HBO series The Wire? It's really awesome. You, did you like it? Oh, okay. Well, I thought it was pretty cool. And the first season is all about wiretapping. They're going after drug dealers and they're doing it by uh, tapping their phones. Uh, and what you learn in that season is that wiretapping is an expensive thing to do. It's operationally expensive. It's capitally expensive. You have to devote space to it. You have to devote expensive resources to monitoring it. They've got to listen in all the time. Uh, and as you can imagine, these poor people are spending three shifts uh, eating cold pizza and drinking warm beer. And 99.9% .9 of what they're hearing is, is that, oh, my kid did great in soccer today, and I need you to bring milk home, and uh, I'm really angry at my boss, he's such a jerk. And so most of that effort is wasted. And this is quite a bit like the uh, distributed sniffing thing. Most of those packets in that distributed sniffing environment you're never ever gonna look at. Uh, so it's a ton of expense uh, without a huge return. Again, there are places where this is crucial, but most of the time you can get what you want with metadata, right? So another way to find out uh, if someone's doing something they shouldn't be is to get a hold of their phone bill. Of course, you've all heard of the NSA. They've made a lot of hay with this kind of information. Uh, and in fact, if you think about it, although this is a very simple set of records and contains no packet data, no voice, uh, I can tell a lot about what's going on in someone's life if I look at it and apply the appropriate algorithms to it. I can tell who they talk to during the day, who they talk to at night, who they prefer to talk to by longer call volumes, uh, when they're likely to have had a wrong number and when it wasn't a wrong number. If I expand and start looking at the people they call and looking at their phone records, I can see who their community of, communities of interest are. If there's a change, if for example they change jobs, it's gonna be obvious in their phone bill because suddenly they'll be calling different sets of people during the day. If uh, they're married and they start cheating on their spouse, that'll be obvious because late at night there'll be all kinds of long calls to new numbers they've never called before. These kind of things stick out like sore thumbs to the correct uh, algorithms properly applied. And the real beauty of this is I do not have to deploy any gear to get it, right? As a police department, I don't have to dedicate a space, buy wiretapping equipment, call the phone company and have them run wire to me and sit people down to listen to it. All I have to do is call them up and say, send me Bob's phone bill. And they're gonna print it right out because this is constructed by the equipment that's doing the phone switching anyway. It's already there. It's already part of the infrastructure. It merely needs to be requested. So it's very, very economical to use, uh, especially as a first line uh, for discovering something going on. Flow-based monitoring is precisely analogous to the phone bill. Uh, and you'll hear, when you hear people talk about NetFlow, they'll talk a lot about network monitoring. It is possible to do network monitoring with NetFlow. In fact, large phone companies have monitored their backbone performance with NetFlow data for a long time. But the flows themselves are actually records of host conversations. This is host data. Just like the phone bill is actually about conversations between individuals on their phones and not about the phone company's network, this is not really about your network. It's about what your hosts are doing every day, all day. It's compact. It is structured, so it's very easy to compress. Uh, and if I apply the right algorithms to it, I can tell a whole lot about what's going on in my environment. This is a very simple protocol and it's the most basic level, it's just a few fields. Yet you would be really shocked if you haven't seen this presentation or a presentation like it before and what you can actually do with it. And in here we have, you know, here's when a conversation started, here's the caller, here's the callee, uh, here's where each of them are, maybe what groups they belong to depending on the system that you're using to do this, the language they're speaking, which is port and protocol the amount of data that's being sent and received for the duration of the conversation, along with a number of other fields. In fact, this is an extensible protocol now. The latest versions of it let you add fields into it. But you really don't need much more than this to really learn a lot of interesting things. 
And the beauty of it, just like the phone bill, is that generally you can just turn it on. A lot of your infrastructure will probably produce it already. It's probably already built in, depending on the choices you've made uh, in what you've purchased. Uh, there are many different versions. As a new Cisco employee, of course, Cisco NetFlow is what I recommend. Uh, but uh, generally, you can turn this on in the environment and start getting this flow data without deploying a single probe uh, or any kind of recording equipment. Uh, and it's uh, widely supported in uh, choke point devices like core switches, uh, perimeter routers going in and out, WAN routers, uh, and uh, firewalls and such. So it's very, very easy to get into. And the beauty of it is, is uh, if a host talks to another host you know, on this network, it only has to cross one flow metering device for me to get everything I need. So if it crosses more than one, I get basically the same record from each one. However, if I have flow even down here in the access layer, I can even see layer two host-to-host -host communications down here with flow. And flow is also agnostic to the type of device. It's not based on an agent installed on anything. So as soon as someone brings in their BYOB device, I see their NetFlow, so I can see them talk too. So I don't care who owns the asset. Once it's in the environment, it's exposed and I can see all of its discussions. I can see it out here between hosts in these sites. I can see meshed traffic between these sites that might be invisible to your normal monitoring. And of course, all the stuff going in and out of the DMZ, the internet, and in and out of the data center and back and forth within the data center. I can get full coverage of every conversation in the environment with this protocol. And what can I do with it? <clears throat> and basically, it's just as easy as forwarding it all to a collection device and applying algorithms to it and looking at graphs and such. So your flow records pour into there and then uh, what you do with them is based on what type of system you're using to collect that data. So what can we do with it? So uh, flow has been around for 20 years. Uh, essentially it started out as a way to accelerate routing speeds and make them as fast as switches. Uh, back in the 90s, uh, 100 meg switches came out and they were amazingly quick. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, Cisco had one that could switch at 30 million packets a second. However, if you had to route, if you had to change the headers and go from one network to another, you'd go down to just a few thousand, 10 to 15,000 packets per second, even on a very large expensive router. So people were all excited about these new speeds, but you can't build giant two, uh, layer two networks back then because of broadcasts. And so everybody was clamoring for a way to move data quicker uh, at layer three. And so Cisco came up with this idea of flow-based switching, where they would have the uh, router or the switch watch the decision the router made, remember it, which port the data was sent out of, and then after the first packet went through the router, from that point on, the switch would just fast switch it based on the flow table. So it was a, amazing because now you could have routing at 30 million packets per second. It was a big, big deal, and lots of people bought it. Not long after they did that, people realized that you could go into these devices and look at these tables of flows, which are basically the records of the discussions between the hosts. And they started saying, hey, there's useful info here. And at first, large phone companies used them for billing. So they would scrape that data out of the switches and routers and then bill their customers. They could do very accurate billing with them. And then they came to Cisco and said, look, we're tired of screen scraping. Can you send this off to us? Can we come up with a protocol and you send this off to us so that we can use it and do our billing automatically and not have to always be logging in and scraping that data out? And so NetFlow Data Export was born, which is the forwarding of flow records as they're generated by this hardware. So some of the first things people did with that was graph it, right? So what we're looking at here is uh, basically protocol over time uh, with respect to data volume. The zero line is the difference between uh, inbound and outbound data. So outbound is below the zero and inbound is above. Uh, along the bottom here, we have a timeline that's day by day. And then over there, the, I'm not sure what you can see, but the, uh, the volume is in uh, uh, bytes and goes up from zero all the way to uh, many gigs at the top and bottom. And so we notice some things right off the bat just by looking at this simple graph, which is something you can do 20 years ago, right? I can see what my dominant protocol is, uh, HTTP, that uh, basically is what's taken up most of the bandwidth on this link. I can see client-server behavior. Uh, I have small requests outbound and large responses, which is something I would expect. 
Uh, I can see that uh, people generally work during the day and don't at night. So that's pretty uh, simple and easy to see. I can also notice anomalous activity, right? I see this one night I had this splash of unprofiled TCP. So this is a, a shot from a, one of uh, uh, Landcope or Cisco Now systems. Uh, and this is traffic that no one has named. We haven't given a name to this application. So this might make me curious, who's doing this unnamed app in the middle of the night and apparently sending out a lot of data? I also see a large SSH transfer here. Now, this is the SSH protocol uh, happening early in the day on uh, uh, Sunday. I might want to go and figure out what that is, right? And then like some other types of graphing, this is backed up by flow records, which are those in individual conversations. I can go in and ask the system who this was. What were the endpoints? When did it begin exactly? When did it end? How did it traverse the network, et cetera? Because it's backed up by those individual records. This isn't like SNMP where I'm just polling and I don't have anything behind it to go in and do any, any investigation on. This is all backed up by flow data. I also note that over time, uh, the data volume is growing. Now, this is because this was taken off of a university's internet presence, uh, and it was just after Christmas and the students were coming back and getting back to work. Uh, so I can see a lot with this with my eyes. And if you can imagine, if I can detect anomalous behavior and patterns and look and make a kind of a visual baseline, imagine if you saw this day after day, anything unusual would stand out. If I can do that with my eyes, if I apply the right math to it, I can get much more granular. This is another example. This is kind of my sledgehammer example. It's famous with NetFlow geeks. Uh, this was an AT&T backbone back in 2003. Uh, and this is SQL Slammer. Uh, to this date, Slammer is the fastest worm. It traversed the globe in 15 minutes. Uh, and uh, essentially, uh, at this point in time, we'd already had Blaster. We'd had LoveSan. We've had, we'd had several other uh, of these flash worms in this about year and a half period. So when this happened, the AT&T folks watching this graph uh, figured it had to be a new flash worm uh, because as you can see, this represents millions of host pair conversations on a large backbone. Uh, this type of data tends to a very, very regular pattern. So things that are unusual, and a four-year-old could point out the anomaly, uh, things that are unusual stick out like a sore thumb. And so AT&T went in and began actually applying filters. They're saying, look, SQL, which is what this traffic is, uh, was not even a top-end protocol anywhere on our backbone before, and suddenly it's dominating. So we're going to start knocking it down. So they did. They were able to deal with this before the AV companies had a name for it in any kind of signature, which was days later. Now, I had customers back then, I was working at Cisco, uh, that were just down. I mean, they got this in their environments, they were dead. Uh, and in fact, I had one, a large shipping company, they had to go into their data center, they pulled all the cables out of the fronts of their switches, and then they got on a phone and plug them in one at a time and said, is it up? Is it working? Okay, cool, that one's good. How about this one? Nope, dead? Okay, leave that one out. We'll figure out what that is. And then trace them all. Two weeks, three million bucks a day they lost. Uh, so it was brutal. AT&T, however, was not only able to start knocking this down, but since this is backed up with flow data, they could pull up the flow records, see the sources, call their customers and say, here's a list of your infected systems. This is a watershed moment for the industry. And uh, this was when Langcope started using NetFlow as its primary protocol. Uh, because we realized that we didn't need packet data at the time we were sensor based and acted like an IDS. We didn't need packet data to do the type of statistical detection that we were doing. So we want full NetFlow at this point in time. So essentially hosts have habits just like we do. Uh, some hosts are a lot more habitual than others, but all of them have habits. Uh, so for example, you come in during the day and plug your machine in. Uh, it uh, goes and tries to get an address from your DHCP server. I didn't draw the reverse path. You'll have to imagine it. I'm not a PowerPoint wizard and just doing all these arrows drove me absolutely insane. So uh, <laughs> forgive me. Uh, but uh, you know, it does a boot peer DHCP request. Back comes your address. Then it does a DNS to find your login server. Uh, then it does auth. So in a Microsoft environment, this would be Kerberos uh, and logs you in. Then you start uh, maybe a login script and attach your file shares and such with SMB. 
uh, and then you start your day and start actually working, right? And this, most of that just takes seconds. Uh, but this habit is every day when you plug your machine in. So now you work for five minutes. Now that five minutes is up and it's time to do what you really do all day, which is uh, surf the web. And so you, you know, DNS out, you look for facebook.com or sports center or whatever. Uh, and then you start surfing the web. You do that till noon. Uh, you go to lunch, you come back, you do five more minutes of SQL. Uh, then you surf the web for the rest of the afternoon and at 4.55 you clock out and leave, right? And so you have this same pattern day after day after day. And even folks in IT that are using lots and lots of tools, they tend to do the same things all the time. So when they do something really strange, it stands out like a sore thumb, right? If you're watching, uh, it's obvious when things change. And this is where we're focused. We focus on change. We watch every host in the environment, watch what they're up to, build a detailed, uh, basically statistical analysis of all the things that we can glean from flow and then tell you when things change. This is kind of a sledgehammer example again, uh, but we can be far, far more granular. So what we do with uh, flow data is we have a whole list of parameters that we track. There's about 94 of them. Uh, and uh, some of them are obvious, like total traffic over a 24 hour period. Then we'll have high traffic over a 24-hour period. Then we have traffic on the hour, traffic on the minute, traffic per host we talk to, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, flooding, scanning, you name it. Uh, the, there are many of these parameters. And for each one, we build a baseline of how the uh, host, uh, you know, does whatever that parameter is. This particular one is a high traffic uh, alert. What you're looking at is you're looking at a statistical graph of its norm, which is basically its midline, its median, and how far it's deviating from that norm. And on average over the day, the amount of deviation it does on average is called a standard deviation. That's how far outside the norm a host deviates in statistics. If the host does lots of spiky stuff and then calms down for a while and lots more spiky stuff, it'll have a very wide standard deviation. If it's very, very even, it does just about the same all the time, it'll have a very narrow standard deviation. And then what we do is we watch for them to go outside of their standard deviation. And you can tune this by this tolerance knob. And when you move it, the, uh, the, the place where the alert will move up and down on this graph so you don't have to be a statistician to understand what's going on. But you can make this very, very sensitive or very, very insensitive to these changes. Now, it comes out of the box with a lot of this stuff preset, all the behavioral analysis and the setting of the standard deviations and all that kind of stuff for every one of these parameters is automated. But it's all tunable per host, per group, you name it, you can, you can tune it. I just wanted to show you that this is a very, very deep statistical analysis system. It's not a simple thing like you might have heard from other companies that claim to be behaviorally based. And again, we're doing this all with nothing more than this very, very simple protocol. What we do when they deviate and they trigger these alerts, whether it's a host or a group or whatever, is we start to give them what we call concern points, which you can think of as demerits. So a host will accumulate these points. And then we give you a list of hosts that are behaving badly. Uh, in this case, these are hosts that, whose uh, behavior today looks significantly different than it has over the past 30 days amongst all those parameters. So these are all rolled up. The concern index in this case is a composite metric of all those different parameters. And so they will accumulate concern. And what we do is we rank them by how rapidly they're changing, which is far more important than just how many points they have accumulated. Some hosts will accumulate points just as part of their normal activity. But hosts that change rapidly are a big deal. Uh, and then we let you zero in on them and find out why. So this host, uh, we've pulled in and looked at the security events they are adding concern to the host, happens to be doing a lot of scanning on the SMB port. So these are scans against these networks, and we, we uh, mark them as network scans because they've tried to touch six or more hosts in those ranges without getting a response, which is a uh, classic scanning behavior. And this is how many of them they have done in this time period, which is today. So, you know, 4,000, 4,000, 4,000 attempts against hosts that don't exist in those uh, network areas. That's why they boiled up to the top of the CI report, and that's a host you should go look at, because it looks like it's got a config or variant on it. We know when each one of these started. If it stopped, we know when it stopped, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> 
Then I can click on the identity tab in this host snapshot report, which is the report I've drilled into, and I can see who is logged in. So I can link this system with your identity system, and now I have attribution. So I'm not stuck with an IP address and out running around going into other systems trying to figure out who was on the system at the time. So I can see, you know, basically the only person using this host is Erin. She's using the same host all the time. It's a Windows box. So the identity solution in this case is ICE, uh, Cisco ICE, which provides a lot of detail. I can see the switch she's on. I can see the switch port she's plugged into. So I have a, a lot of knowledge before I ever get up from my desk. I also get lots of other things that I can do with NetFlow. I can do the classic graphing. And in this case, I'm looking at, for example, a graph of the activity of all my end user devices. So my system lets you group hosts by any criteria you'd like and then treat them as if they're all in a single box that you are looking at a span session on. So in this case, all the end user uh, devices all around the globe I'm looking at all at once. And I can see that most of the time their activity is pretty uh, regular, but I had these spikes that I might want to dig into and look at. Over here I get like who are the top uh, talkers going in and out of the, the user device group into other groups, who are the top peers they're talking to, and who are the top user devices talking to other user devices in that group. So I can just add a glance, and this is just a sample report. Uh, we have zillions of them, but just a sample of the types of things you can do uh, with this technology. And everything in here is clickable. So I can point anywhere I want on a graph or a table and right click and get a context sensitive menu and drill in. So if I'm looking, for example, at this little spike of data and I think it looks odd to me, I can right click, say, let's see the flows for that particular uh, sp uh, spike at that moment and pull up a flow table. And if I have user data associated with it, they're over here and I've got a list of flows. I can pick a flow and then drill into it with what we call a quick view and now I'm looking at the conversation itself. So I've gone from the 10,000 foot view down to the individual flow record or flow records that I received that make up this conversation. And I can tell everything. I can tell, you know, who, what, when, where. There's who, what, when, where, how much uh, traffic that was tra traversed. Uh, since I crossed a host that's given me NAT data, I can even see the NAT translation here. Uh, so if they went outside, I'm not stuck with the outside IP address. Uh, I can tell who the host was on the inside that generated that. This is big for universities that have to respond to RIAA and MPAA uh, queries about people uh, stealing music. Uh, and it's often a problem in monitoring, not being able to tell what happened after they crossed your NAP boundary. Uh, so basically, I can tell pretty much anything I want about this uh, particular thing. And I started again with a high-level view on a graph and drilled right down to this in a couple clicks. I can also click here on this interfaces tab, and I can see the path it took in both directions. So this is, again, the same conversation, and now I can see the outbound path from the client to the server, and then the inbound path from the server to the client. I can check and see if I have symmetry. Uh, I can tell uh, on the inbound interfaces that support QoS what the QoS markings were. Uh, we had a customer not too long ago that uh, had a problem they'd been dealing with for a long time, and that problem was with um, a real-time protocol was essentially phone calls, and between certain groups, the phone calls would be garbled, and they couldn't figure out why. And if you've ever tried to troubleshoot QoS in a large network, the way routers do it is different than the way switches do it, and even in different switch models and switch code, there are different methods, and some of it's somewhat simple to to figure out, and others is not so simple. It's kind of a, a black art. It's tough. Uh, and so go, going from interface to interface, figuring out where their traffic went, and then figuring out which interface was mismarking the traffic was uh, really vexing them. Once this tool was in, however, they were able to pick a pair of endpoints that were having a problem, go in and look, and they had AF31, AF31, their DSCP values, and then best effort. So they knew which interface, or at least near which interface, the problem uh, existed. So we can extend the functionality of this kind of thing far outside of what you would normally think of as a security issue. Oh, and the firewalls, uh, some firewalls will even report whether or not they blocked or permitted. And uh, that too can be stuffed in a flow record and we'll report on it. But that's not all. 15 minutes. So uh, 
First of all, we let you, as, as I said earlier, group hosts. Uh, you can group them by any criteria you like. Host groups are virtual containers of IP addresses that can be anything. Uh, it's common for people to, to do them by locations. So you've got your Atlanta IP addresses, your you know, Houston, et cetera, IP addresses. But you can do them you know, by server type, by uh, business process, by uh, user group, uh, anything you can think of. And then you can use them as a monitoring tool or draw relationships between them and monitor relationships. So in this case, we have a PCI relationship map. This is an active document. Uh, I've got all my PCI hosts gathered in this host group on this document. So no matter where they are worldwide, I've got them in this single object. And I've got my internal servers here, which are allowed to talk to them, internal users, which aren't, and then the internet, which isn't, and then maybe some engineering groups that might go in and do some modifications on them from time to time. And now I can set rules on the, these relationships and say, between, for example, my internal users and PCI, no access. So if I ever see one frame go in either direction, uh, I want to know about it. And I don't care what path it took. This is topology independent. These are not wires. This is just a relationship between them. So if my internal users are scattered around the globe and my PCI devices are scattered around the globe, I now have a way of monitoring, monitoring them with these two objects in this one relationship and can show an auditor whether or not anyone ever talked to them. Same thing going out to the internet. You can do this thing called host locking uh, or custom events and know the first packet that uh, violates our policy. So I get complete visibility into this. Uh, here's an example. Oh, go ahead. So if, if you've got the uh, PCI device, you've got like the blocking, like you say you don't want any going on between this guy and this guy, and then you see it happening, and then, then you said, like, what, what happens at that point? So up until recently, we were completely passive. So what we would do is alert. That alert would generally go to a SIM. The SIM could then be used to trigger an action uh, in the environment. Uh, what we've done is we have now uh, worked with Cisco and, and their PX Grid protocol, and we can actually give you the ability to quarantine a host that's violating a policy. So you can click a button, the PX Grid action will then tell ICE to uh, change its security group and knock it off the network essentially. Well, when you click the button, it happens pretty much immediately. But somebody has to be looking. You have to be monitoring it. We don't want to take automatic action. In fact, in all my years of uh, doing security stuff, I've had a lot of people say I want automatic this and that, but no one ever turns it on because they're scared to death about what's going to happen. I don't want to make any assumptions about what might trigger in here, uh, you know, based on what you might think. So you're going to want to have some human brain power in there to look at this stuff. But... Uh, this is generally in an environment going to send a high value alert to your SIM. Somebody's going to get a page and they're going to go in and look at it right away. Just like anything else that's high value uh, triggering your uh, SIM activity. Uh, we can also, if you don't use a SIM or you don't want it to report to the SIM, we can do all kinds of paging and all that stuff directly out of the system. But usually our customers will be sending this data to their SIM. Here's another example. This is a SCADA example. Um, so let's say you've got to deal with a SCADA on a large uh, gas delivery or power network. Uh, these are extremely high-risk networks. Like a lot of uh, similar networks with similar devices, they've all been piled into IP, uh, yet none of the devices were written really with any security in them whatsoever. And so power companies and all that have all kind of spent every day praying that nothing blows up their gas valves. Uh, or gets control of them. They're really Swiss cheese, so it's very dangerous. But now all I have to do is put all the gas valve IP addresses here, the legitimate controller here, and now I can monitor this situation easily with just two icons. I can go in and say, who's talking to my gas valves? And there's a list. And if they're not what I expect, then I can go in and investigate any of them I want to. I can go in uh, and use it in a medical environment. I can group my dialysis machines, for example, in a host group. And then the dialysis server that talks to them here in this group. And then other groups, including things like my guest access uh, network, uh, and make relationships there. And then look and see who's touching my dialysis machines. Is that angry teenager who doesn't want to be sitting in the hospital because his mom's sick, messing around with this script kitty stuff and actually pinging these machines or touching the heart monitor or trying to jackpot my automated pharmacy. All that is just simple uh, with this tool set. And again, using nothing more than flow. 
Show me the overall gas control profile. Show me what's going on between those systems, which hosts are involved, et cetera, et cetera. All right at your fingertips, all near real time. We get this data every 60 seconds from every host in the environment. Uh, you can create custom apps in here and monitor them as well. Uh, this is an example from my network at home. I run a Minecraft server for a bunch of kids uh, in the neighborhood who've all gone off to college and they're still using it. In fact, I just spent thousands of dollars upgrading it just so they could play with it. I feel pretty stupid about that. Anyway, uh, so uh, I have this uh, internal server. This is an internal address. Uh, that's the protocol it's on, and that's Minecraft in my environment. However, attackers like to hide in protocols you're using. Uh, and so what I don't want to do is say, okay, 24.320 TCP is Minecraft, and I'm going to ignore it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to mark 24.320 TCP to this device as Minecraft, but if I see it to any other device, I want to know. And so I can set an alert like that as well. Um, I could go on and on and on and on about all the functions that are capable, you're capable of doing with Flow. Depending on the Flow tools, you can do some of these with anything. Uh, all the ones I've shown you are from StealthWatch, our tool set. Uh, but basically, Flow Analysis fills that gap. You get the ability to visualize and see every conversation in the environment and to know what's normal and react rapidly when something changes on a host-by-host -host, uh, basis everywhere. And our customers have realized a lot of bonuses from taking advantage of it, which is one of the reasons Cisco just bought our company. <laughs> Any questions? Just buy a Cisco product. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, Cisco's been a customer of Lanco for years and years, so I think that was another driver. Right, and that's a common request. Uh, in fact, uh, people have, um, there's scripting available in the tool. People have scripted uh, capture uh, out of the tool in the past. But essentially what we've done is we've partnered with, uh, we had partnered with a third party, but the Cisco purchase changed that. So we've partnered with the, the group in Cisco that uh, makes the NAM, the network analysis module, which is a capture device. And basically what you're gonna be able to do is put a NAM in a, a place where you have high value data and it'll have a rolling buffer, a circular buffer, always recording. And then if we have an issue, you can have an alarm trigger that thing to grab the exact data that uh, caused the issue and drop that to a PCAP file. Uh, so that is a near future capability. In fact, uh, in our next version of software, you'll be able to do it semi-manually. We're going to work uh, over the next six months or so into making it completely automated. What do you mean? How can a, an attacker manipulate? Yeah, the problem, the, the great thing about flow is, is that the attacker has an objective. The objective may be steal data. That means they're going to have to move that data out. Whatever they do to do it, it's going to look different than it did yesterday. Whether they, I mean, this is almost immune even to encryption. Very few of those parameters are about the protocol. They're about how many connections, where are the connections going? When did they start? When did they stop? Yeah, I, I'd say probably the most common attempt uh, would be to take a long time. Uh, but even that can be tuned and made obvious. Uh, you know, you would have to take a really, really long time to hide from this behavioral monitoring. It's very, very sensitive. Yeah, well, first you'd have to know it was there, right? So uh, you'd have to have something on the network that could see that flow data was being sent and then make an assumption about where it was going. But if you did that, yeah, again, that would make a change. There might be some start in something, and now all of a sudden UDP data is getting monkeyed with. So from that host, things have changed. Uh, so again, it's going to probably pop up on the concern index. So usually uh, a lot longer than you'd expect. So uh, an example is a company like Boeing. Uh, 
when I worked with Boeing, uh, Todd was a Boeing SE for a while too. When I worked with them, their flow volume was about 650,000 flows a second. They were using 12 flow collectors to receive that data. That's a very, very high flow rate. That's their global WAN. And they had 90 days. Uh, Cisco is at 800 and something thousand flows a second. They're collecting them in, I think, 11 or 12 flow collectors as well, and they're almost 50 days. I've had customers that you know, bought larger collectors because they wanted longer periods of time, and they went into the years of storage. So it's far, far longer than, than packet capture because it's really, really easy to compress this data, and the records themselves are very small. Thank you.